Good morning, everyone. I know we've got lots and lots of folks joining us this morning. We're just a few minutes away from starting our webinar at the heart of the matter here with the Colorado Health Foundation. So if you are tuning in to hear more about fierce women driving social change, you are in the right place. We're gonna continue to give folks uh, a few minutes to log in and get settled. And for those of you who are already uh, on the line with us, um, we are hoping we can hear a little bit from you. We recognize that each of you are showing up today with intentionality and also wanna recognize that today happens to be Women's Equality Day. And although the day certainly has its own challenging history, it marks the monumental 1920 law giving women the right to vote and reminds us of the unique challenges that women, especially women of color, continue to face. So with that in mind, we wanna hear from you about who the fearless women in your life are. Uh, while the rest of our attendee attendees continue to join, go ahead and share with us using the chat function uh, who those fierce and fearless women in your life are. And so while we wait for everybody to join, if you have, there we got some names popping up there, icons, moms, grandmas. Uh, if you've just joined us in the last 30 seconds or so, um, we're just waiting for everyone to join on the line and asking each of you to share with us uh, using the chat function um, who those fierce and fearless women in your life are. And if you open up the chat function, you can see lots and lots of answers popping up here. So we do still have people joining. Um, I want to go ahead and, and welcome all of you who are on the line already and kick off with some important information. For those of you who are Spanish speakers, uh, we are offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish for this event. And I'm excited to introduce Indira Guzman from Community Language Cooperative, who will explain the interpretation feature in Zoom that she and her colleague Jasmine will be managing for the event today. And um, quick thank you, Indira, to you and your team. You all are always fantastic partners to us here at the foundation as we try our best to provide translation and interpretation services. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Indira. Thank you so much. Uh, today we are going to uh, create a space where language justice is practiced. And what that means is that people will be able to participate and listen in the language of their heart. Today we will be interpreting into Spanish and English if needed. So we ask that when interpretation goes on that you could turn on, if you need it, interpretation into either Spanish or English. Um, there will be a button next to the recording button that says interpretation and just please select the language that you prefer. You can also select to silence the uh, original audio if you don't want to hear both the interpretation and the original speaker. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Indira Guzmán y ahora vamos a practicar la justicia del lenguaje y para esto vamos a usar la interpretación simultánea y vamos a ofrecer interpretación al inglés y en español. Entonces, si sí, por favor, cuando prendamos la interpretación puede seleccionar el idioma que prefiere en el icono que dice interpretación, en un segundo va a aprender, este asegúrese de elegir el idioma que prefiere escuchar. Uh, muchas gracias. Si tiene pregunta, por favor, uh, mándelo en el chat. Gracias. Thank you. Can you please turn on interpretation now? Thank you so much, Indira, and welcome again, everyone officially. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event. Uh, my name is Taryn Ford. I'm the Senior Director of Communications here at the Colorado Health Foundation, and I'm going to be sharing with y'all just a few opening and housekeeping remarks, and then we'll get started with our panel. Uh, for those of you who are um, less familiar with the foundation or don't know us at all, uh, we are focused squarely on working to bring help and reach for all Coloradans. And we do that work in a variety of ways, predominantly by engaging closely with communities across the state through investing in grant making, through our public policy and advocacy work, by striving to learn more about how Coloradans feel and think about health, and finally, we also do our work through moments like this one today, where we gather together to discuss and explore tough and complex matters related to inequity. I'm excited to introduce our second virtual event in the At the Heart of the Matter series. 
Here at the foundation, we, like so many of you, had to rethink how we would continue engaging and listening to community throughout the pandemic. And this new virtual series is our way of leaning in on some tough subject matter that gets at the heart of what we're solving for through our mission. So from now through November, our president and CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation, Karen McNeil Miller, will be hosting monthly conversations with local and national leaders to discuss the impacts of and solutions for long present systemic racism and the effect that it has on our health. Today for our second conversation, at the heart of the matter, fierce, fearless women leading social change, Karen is joined by a really powerful group of female leaders. I think y'all are gonna really enjoy this today. They're gonna to be discussing the intersection of racism and sexism, the impact that it has on our health, and how each of them are fearlessly and fiercely dismantling unjust systems and helping lead today's racial justice movement. So before we launch into the panel, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, a recording of this conversation and a quick evaluation survey will be sent to you tomorrow, so look for that in your inbox. Um, we really value thoughts and ideas and feedback, so make sure to share those with us so we can improve some of our future events. Um, the recording of this conversation will also be added to our event webpage uh, in the coming weeks. And I'm just checking our participant number. Uh, we are pleased to have hundreds of people joining us today, so we've muted audio to minimize background noise. And uh, rather than host a specific Q&A period, we're actually encouraging all of your questions throughout the course of the event. So go ahead and type questions into the chat box and we'll do our very best to answer them. We also ask that if you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation to please type those into the chat box. And lastly, if you just joined us in the last couple of minutes and would like to use the Spanish interpretation feature, please go ahead and check the, check the chat box for information about how to do that or chat us and we will connect you with the Spanish interpretation team. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Tanaya Winder. She's an author, singer, songwriter, poet, motivational speaker, and educator who ta whose talks emphasize the importance of heart work. Tanaya, thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you. I am honored to be here with you all. I'm going to start by doing a spoken word poem that I wrote um, for the water protectors during Standing Rock, and it's called Resistance. Resistance, noun. One, to exert oneself so as to counteract or defeat. Two, to withstand the force or effect of. Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. And the concussion grenades, red glare, water cannons bursting in freezing air temperatures, rubber bullets shot at water protectors gave proof through the night that America ca, ca, is still spelled with three Ks. America, a word that starts with an A turned upright like pointed white hoods saluting the settler colonialism. Ism, ism, a dangerous definition or doctrine of discovery buried in the highest court of the land supreme. Supremacy of the free, home of the brave braves who became animals upon discovery. But you cannot discover a people who already existed and you cannot find something that was never lost. Even an indigenous Holocaust couldn't get us written about in history books. Our numbers may not be written on arms, but you can count the amount of headstones from children buried in Indian boarding schools. America thought we died there when they cut our hair, stabbed our tongues into silence, pried our mouths open into singing anthems of freedom in English, a language America force fed down our throats like a pill called assimilation, telling us to let go of all that we hold sacred like our connection to the land, by moving us onto reservation into desolation, a symbolic annihilation so deafening today, people forget we exist or that we are real. Never seen beyond the painted faces of Washington, redskins, this corporate colored redskins, our identity and bleeds in a country built on the backs of brown bodies, genocide and slavery. What do those stars and stripe, stripes represent when those in power won't honor our treaty rights? Whose rights when we all have a right to survive and be free, to live, to drink clean water and not build walls around these man-made borders? When history is written by colonizers, they are always the heroes. 
colonizer made from colon, body politic, a black snake swallowing everything, a black snake swallowing everything, a black snake swallowing everything. When they're drilling in the name of money and killing our water and soil in the name of oil and our sisters are being stolen and the holes we dig in the earth mirror the holes we keep digging in ourselves, we keep digging in ourselves, we keep digging in ourselves. And who can tell what is the real truth when alternative facts are birthed in a colonial womb, but the revolution will never be won through patriarchy or held in the fists or lips of patriarchal men, but it will be born from women who know how to carry movements in the womb of intertwining lives. The revolution will be birthed from women who know that deliverance and delivery come from being ripped open in an unstoppable force that reminds us our, our most powerful weapons will always be giving life and a body in prayer that stands up unafraid to speak. Can you see me? Can you see us when you sing? Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the lands, land of the free and the home of the brave. You have the right to remain silent, but you also have the right not to be. Thank you. Tanea, thank you so much for blessing us with your gift. That you couldn't see it, you couldn't see the chat, but there was snapping going on and people are just blown away by that. And everyone's asked for a copy of it, so we will certainly do that. I'm gonna ask all of the panelists if they could uh, put themselves up on the screen. So first, let me welcome all of you in attendance. We've got, right now I'm looking at the count, over 400, almost 475 logged in. We had uh, a few more than that who've registered. So I want to first welcome you as the CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation, welcome you to this event. And I want to start with some gratitude. First, gratitude to all of you who are in attendance because I know you had so many other things you could do. And the fact that you felt that this conversation, this topic was worthy of your time, honors us. And we certainly hope to honor you. And in the next for you to feel like this was time well spent for you. I also want to thank the incredible um, communications team at the Colorado Health Foundation, led by Taryn Fort Doyle, who you all uh, saw at the very beginning welcoming everyone and a special shout out to Jacqueline Lindzen for first of all putting together this great panel, putting together the series and uh, just managing this whole process. So I want to just thank all of them. We had over, as of this morning, over 800 registrants for this event. 98% of those registrants are women. And that just speaks to the hunger and desire that women have for this conversation, for this kind of conversation. And to the 2% of our highly enlightened brothers, we welcome you and we welcome you to the fight. So I want to introduce you to the, to the women that are going to be joining us in this conversation. We call this, you know, fierce and fearless women uh, fighting for social change. We had to limit the number of adjectives or just the title would have gotten too long. But let me assure you that not only each and every one of these women fierce and fearless, they are collectively and individually also fascinating, formidable, far-sighted fiery, funny, fantabulous, frank. And because the English language in written form and in 
spoken form don't always coincide, it also allows me to say that they are phenomenal. So let me introduce you to these women and you're going to get to see all of those attributes on full display in the next few moments. So let me reintroduce you to Tanea Winder, who did our opening poem. Tanea is the founder of Dream Warriors Management and As Us, a space for women in the world. So Tanea, raise your hand again for people who just joined so they can see you. Representative Leslie Herod from the Colorado General Assembly. Let us see who you are, Leslie, great. Uh, Nabung Sandoval, who's the Refugee Congress Delegate for Colorado. Nah, raise your hand. Magda King, General Manager for Antlers at Vail. And Lauren Castile, Women's Foundation, CEO of the Women's Foundation of Colorado. Ladies, who run the world? All right, you can take, you can unmute yourselves. We do. Yeah. Because you know, there's, you know from, from Beyonce's song, there's an answer to that. Who runs the world? Girls. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Now, I, before we get dive into the conversation, I just want to say, uh, I want to take a moment to let people know that phenomenal doesn't skip a generation. And I want to do that, but I'm going to show, the, show everyone uh, a picture. So I have a picture to put up. It's on its way, trust me. This oh, is a picture of the September cover of Vogue magazine. Vogue. Um, ask two artists, a black, African-American male and a young African-American female artist to design the covers for the September issue. And they were given free reign of what they would paint as long as it included an article of clothing that was somewhere in the edition. You can't see the very bottom of that picture, but at the bottom of the picture there is attribution and, um, and it says the words Jordan Castile. Jordan is the daughter of Lauren Castile. Ooh. So we wanted to take this moment to first give a huge shout out to Jordan and a you go girl <laughs> and give Lauren who's starting to cry already a moment, to, a, a moment to bask <laughs> A moment to bask in the glory of being Jordy's mom. So, Lauren, you want to say just a few words about Jordy and this and this uh, well, amazing woman you produced? Yeah, I am. I have to admit, I'm I'm floored by this. And seriously, after having heard Tanea, I said to you, Tanea, I have a soft spot for creatives, and that was why I was glad you're a part of the program. But what people need to know is that Jordan is a graduate of East High School here in Denver, Colorado, and who had the, um, the distinct blessing of discovering a gift when she was 21 uh, in oil paint. And she uses her voice of oil painting to celebrate people of color, specifically um, at all times. And the woman who's featured here, Aurora James, that Jordan got to choose as her subject, uh, started the movement of the 15% where businesses will um, have 15% of their vendors, of their photographers, of products um, in stores, et cetera, et cetera, will be owned by um, people of color. So the two of them together as two black women Aurora James, who is featured here, and my daughter is really quite something. And only three other um, painters have ever done Vogue. One of whom was um, Salvador, was- uh, Salvador Dali. Yeah. So 
So anyway, enough. Right. <laughs> Congratulations, Joyce. <laughs> we just have to we just have to share <laughs> and celebrate that. Uh, so the, we're going to have a conversation, but as Taryn was saying earlier, we want to make sure as many of you can get in the conversation as well. So please put any questions, comments, perspectives you want in the chat. I'm going to try to keep up with it. Uh, some foundation staff are keeping up. We'll bring as many of those thoughts and questions into the conversation as we can. And I wanted to also share something else. Speaking of phenomenal women, you know, we seek and receive lots of feedback uh, about all of our work. And one of my most um, uh, prolific um, feed, sources of feedback is my mother. And after the last session, after the, la the first event we did, my mother said, well, you know, you were looking down, you look like you were looking down all the time. You know, and I said, well, I'm trying to explain, well, mom, I'm trying to facilitate this whole discussion and I'm trying to look at the chat box and I'm watching everybody's face and I'm taking notes. And she just said, well, you just, just you know, to fix that. So mama, I have repositioned my camera. I've raised my seat. I'm going to sit up straight and try to look more into the camera. So when I get, when I talk to you later tonight, I'll get a good report. And there's not much I can say because my kids say I do the same thing to them. So I can't talk about that. And I saw many of you in the chat box when the question was, as you were introducing yourselves in the chat box, of who are some of the phenomenal women in your life? So many of you put your mothers, your daughters, your aunts, your tias, and so we, uh, we do run the world. And so we are going to have the conversation about what's going on with, for, and about women here in Colorado. So ladies, I hope y'all can swim or you bought your life jacket because we are going to dive right into the deep end. So we've got recent events where we've had um, Representative Alexandria Casio cortez commonly known as AOC, who was in public, called uh, an FNB by a colleague. We have uh, the new Democratic nominee for Vice President, Kamala Harris, who has been called um, nasty, angry, a hoe, and even since last night, Twitter has spent more time talking about the First Lady's clothing than they have about anything she had to say. So are these scenarios at all? And if so, how are they indicative of what's life like as a woman here in Colorado today? So I'm going to start with um, now. How would you respond to that? First of all, thank you so much for having me, for all those who are joining us. What a phenomenal, phenomenal group of women. In response to your question, Karen, I would have to say that obviously they're doing something right to get that type of reaction. Because if we don't get a response to what the work that you're doing by those who truly need to hear this message, then you're truly not making the kind of impact to move the needle that you're supposed to. So I commend the women who are making the waves and raising their voices in order to get these reactions because th guess what? Those reactions make the media. The reactions get reactions from people who disagree and it starts a conversation. So it's absolutely necessary. Great, thank you. Magda, what do you think? Let me unmute here. So yes, I agree with Nan. It's, um, First and foremost, I do believe, you know, that reaction is needed. And also, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame that we are going through, you know, these times where smart women that are, you know, voicing out the opinions um, are just, you know, so wrongfully uh, ashamed for, for what they are doing. And 
you know, that fuels. I, I think that after, you know, seeing many of the things, I look at themselves even more, pay more attention to their words. Um, it's important for us to filter what people say and, and, and what we think and so forth. So, um, yeah, I think that, as I said, it's a shameful, but it's necessary and kudos for them to stand up. And I think that's exactly what we need to produce change. Lauren. You know, I think everything that Na and Magda has said is true, but I'd also like to bring another perspective. Um, absolutely in the course of history as certainly for black women, um, the stereotypes and the extreme of the stereotypes, whether it was mammy or angry or hypersexualized in some form, um, has created this long-standing perpetuation of images of us that also don't allow for the full range of our humanity. And one of the things that I'd like to bring up is I, um, there was a time Michelle Obama spoke for the Women's Foundation of Colorado at the Pepsi Center. And she was asked a question, um, when one breaks through the glass ceilings, no one talks about the shards that fall. And I asked her which shards hurt the most. And she said they were the ones that were intended to hurt. And they were the things that people said about her body, about her being angry, about her being rude. And she acknowledged that there's pain that's also associated with that. And I think it's important for us, even in our fierceness as we stand up and we are, we're bold or brave, um, that there is also that other side that Michelle Obama spoke of, of pain that is associated with those kinds of comments, with those reflections and those, those stereotypes. Tanea. I really um, agree and, and love the comments that all, all of you shared. And, and I like really resonated when you were saying, Lauren, just about these prescribed roles that people have given us. And when we don't fit in those roles as women of color, like that scares people. But I do feel also as, as women of color in leadership positions that we're held to that higher level of accountability, which I think also makes us great leaders because people are watching every move, because people are wanting us to fail, because people are judging and they want to catch us. They want to catch us slipping up to be able to say like, oh, that is because you're a B or that's because X, Y, Y and Z. And I think we're held to, I think we're high, held to that higher level of accountability. And I think that is what makes us even more powerful because we know, like we know we have to be these intentional leaders and we know that we have to be these cautious leaders. And I, even though like a lot of people are saying negative things about women of power on social media, I think what a time to be alive. Like what a time to be a young girl to see so many women of color in these leadership positions and to see how they handle when somebody you know, is essentially bullying them, like to see somebody in power who might have more power than them speak ill about them and to see just how with grace, I think a lot of like AOC, I think handles all these comments with ferocity and with grace. And I, and I love learning just seeing how she handles that negativity. I think it helps me. Leslie, what do you think? Well, thank you so much for having me, Karen, and for this conversation. I agree with what the women were saying, I think as a, as a woman, as a black woman, and then as the first black queer LGBTQ person to hold elected office in Colorado, um, the sexism, the misogyny, the racism, all combined, the homophobia, all combines for me, you know? Um, what we find with women who are young, of color, and from maybe, you know, different sexual orientations is that we are still exotified, we are still sexified, you know? And for so long, women have taken that, especially in politics, and turned it into, we must wear pantsuits, we must not have a shape, we must not be beautiful, you know? For even just our words to get focused on. And guess what? Still didn't work. You're Then you're too tough, you're a bitch, you're bossy, you're all these other things. And so what I find that's really important is for us to just like, step up and be ourselves. And that could include being beautiful. That can include being sexy, you know, without having to um, change who we are to fit 
what a man wants us to be or in order to fit a man's standard. Instead, we should make our own standard for all of us, you know, and support each other and lift us up. One thing I saw with AOC um, was, and first I should say all these women on this panel do that. And I'm so excited to be here with you and you're all speaking very truthfully about who you really are. One thing I saw was AOC did a recent um, thing for a mainstream magazine, which for a politician to be in a mainstream magazine is pretty big deal because we are people, human beings, and folks forget about that. AOC is not a robot. She talked about her skincare regimen and she added this layer of, you know, power to that. Like why she wears her red lipstick, you know, how she, you know, washes off the weight of the world every day. And I thought it was a great video, but in the comments, it was like, oh, you can't speak about, you know, your beauty routine and be taken seriously as a politician. Why the heck not? You know, why can't we celebrate our womanhood and in that have our power and then also be able to, of course, do the work of the people or do the work that we're supposed to be doing and be strong and honored in that. And so I appreciate how she's been breaking down the stereotypes, breaking down these like roles that we're supposed to fit. And I see so many women going into elected office and in elected office doing it too, because we have to. And we now have role models who are saying we can be who we are, which I love. So, and all of those were, those were national women. How do you see those same kinds of things playing out in Delta, Colorado, in Palisade, Colorado, in Glenwood Springs, in Jeff County, Jeffco County, in Centennial and Denver. How is this, how do you see this affecting the lives of the women we know and love and interact with every day around the state? Who wants to start on that one? Leslie, I'm, yeah. you're so I'm gonna let you start. Sure, well, I mean, listen, it's the same thing right here in Colorado, you know? Um, it is no different based on where you are located. It just might be magnified based on your, your profile, you know, but women are feeling the same thing across the board. I mean, I speak to teachers, you know, uh, especially women of color teachers who are feeling the same way, right? Um, I speak to doctors who are still treated this way. And meanwhile, you know, our, our essential workers that we lift up and then they are still treated the exact same way, you know? Um, and so I don't really see necessarily a difference because at the end of the day, people are more likely to judge us based on our appearance, right, than our resume and our experience, which I think is hugely problematic. And we've got to stop, we have to continue to fight against that. I believe the way we do that is by putting more powerful, strong, bold women into these positions of power to make those final decisions. Um, but it's real everywhere. It's not different anywhere. I think there are nuances, though, um, you know, that, that come up within our rural communities or, you know, we don't talk often enough about the fact that there's a reservation in the state of Colorado, you know, and, and the Ute Mountain community and, um, and how if one translates that to what's happening in Navajo communities around COVID um, and the role that women are having to play there. I hope Magda shares some of her story, the fierceness that Magda has had to show in order in Vail, Colorado to become GM of Antlers when she started as a housekeeper um, uh, is, is really essential. And the Na story certainly in terms of immigration um, and, and being refugees within our community. But I wanna raise a question as well about how do we as women support each other in that process? I know I raised the question of pain and we'll say, yeah, girl, get out there, get out there. But Leslie, you just referenced something. And then folks also will tear down, right? Will perpetuate. Um, I think it's really important for us as women of color, um, as women of color and white women, that we also raise ourselves to say, I will stand with you on that journey. I will block and tackle that pain. I will hold you in that context. I will share that space. And, um, and that's something that I think is the next phase um, that we have to do so there isn't isolation, but a full community of women moving forward together um, that is essential. So Magda, since um, Lauren mentioned you, go ahead and let, let you comment on that. 
So thank you. You know, I would be happy to share my story whenever you would like for me to, but to the point that Lauren was saying just a few minutes ago, you know, your question of what's happening with the voice of, of women here, my first thought was, what is happening with the voice of the Latino women in my community, Eagle County in Bell, Colorado? And then I had to pause and I said, wait a minute, what voice? Where are they? Who are they? And I can tell you, there are some amazing leaders, uh, Latino leaders in our community. And we are trying to learn how to open up through, you know, through the ground to start having a voice. And what Lauren just said is crucial. Um, in the story, whenever you want me to tell it, um, you know, I started very low here at, at the Antlers, and now I am general manager. It took about 14 years for me to be where, where I am, and I have been GM here for the last four. Um, in, my, in my path to success, I was never, it was never my intention to grow by myself. I always thought of my community, my Latino community. I am originally from Ecuador, proud Ecuadorian from Guayaquil. And, um, you know, in Ecuador, we have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of ignorance. And as soon as I arrived here, I very quickly, I wanted to teach our housekeepers to, to, to speak English. When I very soon found out that they did not even know how to read or write in Spanish. Then I thought, oh, I have to go all the way back to start from the basis. And I talked to my manager at the time, and he allowed me to have you know, a room where I would, I would teach them. So as I was progressing in my career, it was my personal job and mission to raise my, 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 you know, my community. Uh, to the point that right now, from all of the housekeepers, every single one knows how to read and write. Everybody has finished elementary school. We have two left, three left for their GED. So everybody has finished high school. And um, one of them, we're trying very hard for her to get into dental hygienist school. And these are women who did not know how to read and write. And now here we are having a book club discussion, you know, every month. And, you know, their remarks are incredible. From all of our, our, our housekeeping staff, one became a US citizen. One was able to buy her home because we work with uh, the library and the common sense of Colorado. We did that program. So one was able to do that. Um, one left her boyfriend. You know, uh, uh, she was a victim of domestic violence. And I am humble because what I thought was, you know, starting, how do we move forward here with education, transforming to this beautiful, powerful story that humbled me. So when you mention about what are we doing as women and how we are uh, tackling this issue, it starts with education and with raising each other. That, that's the key. So I think that's absolutely <laughs> powerful personal testimony, but also it speaks to the, the, the power of community and having high expectations of ourselves and of other people. There is a saying that I love that it says, you know, you don't treat people the way how, uh, uh, for what they are. You treat people for what you want them to become and they will transform into that. And that is absolutely true here. So it has been great and Eagle County, I cannot say enough and you know, they, they are just great, but I don't That's want wonderful. to monopolize the time, so. Well, I want to back up for a minute because you know, we're talking about women. Uh, in, in Colorado. But when you hear the word woman, who's included in that? Tanea, how would you respond to that? Let's say anybody who identifies with the term woman, like there's two-spirit people in our indigenous culture, there's femmes, there's trans women, and I want to make sure that we're always thinking of them and including them as well. Um, one of my dearly beloved is, is trans and I am trying to be a better ally now like and, and learning more and and sometimes like even with the poem I just did, you know, um, I wrote that before I became more educated and I know in the poem I said like one of our most powerful um, like means of existing is is giving life and then I had to take a step back and say well, you know, there are trans women they might not have that like same ability.
be like the cap like that same there might be women who just aren't able to have children like regardless of if you were born a woman or not and so I've been wanting to update and edit that poem because I'll, I'll catch myself like in like unlearning some of these like colonialistic and capitalistic like things that were just put on me and then sometimes when you're re re rereading or re-looking at things you've said you're like wow like that could be really transphobic like I need to like change the way I'm speaking and, th and thinking about things because I want people who identify as, as women to be included in, in these conversations as well. Nah, what would you add to that? You know my thoughts on this from a perspective of someone who is a refugee, who is someone who is Vietnamese, who is someone who identifies as a woman. I feel that definition has started as something very rigid and something that is very uh, indicative of who it was that wrote it, which is not inclusive of every single person that has ever identified as being a woman. So to me, that term really encapsulates so many different things because as with refugees, as with immigrants, we're not a monolith. So that definition needs to absolutely be expanded to anyone who not only identifies, but feels they're in that role to carry out the mission of what they're intended to do. We all have a mission in life, however big or small that mission that you may think it is, but I just feel as though there's twofold. There's the definition that's provided to you and there's the definition that you identified with, right? And historically speaking, it's always been identified by those who wrote the definition. Again, very narrow, very focused in order to elevate the dominant society, as opposed to including every single person who identifies as being in that role. So to me, it's a personal decision on how those identify, but we are moving closer to expanding that definition which is needed because it has been just too, too long that it has not included groups and people who fall into this category, who see themselves into that as part, being part of that category. So I just wanna be clear that when we use the word woman in this conversation, that we are holding all of that in front of us and with us, that it's whomever identifies as a woman. That's what we're talking to, with, and about. So I want to say that that's what we're talking about. But when we speak of women um, in public and when people are talking about women, they're talking about cisgender femme women. I mean, that's and, and, and younger, right? Like that's who that's who's seen. That's who they're talking about. Um, and as someone who identifies as queer, but who, you know, presents as um, possibly straight and definitely cisgender and femme, like that is what people want to see, right? It's like when we say we want women, it's like it's 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 that. And when so when you have gender non-binary women, women who are um, masculine of center, um, androgynous women, rarely ever are those folks actually seen, you know, and included in the conversation when we're speaking of women. And so I, I very much appreciate this panel's very inclusive view of women um, and the intent to 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 change the, per, the common perception of who a woman is, you know? And I, I appreciate the comments in the chat too about women as whoever identifies as women, absolutely. And we gotta make sure that we are seeing more women in what we put out there. I mean, even when I see this pa these panels of, um, you know, these, these and, and they could be artistic interpretations of women, right? Rarely ever do you see a gender non-binary woman or you do, rarely ever do you see someone identifies as a woman who is masculine center. We got to change that. Mm -hmm. well, well, at the like Women's it. Foundation, we actually have contracted with Ricky Wilchins with True Child. Yay, you know, Ricky. Yeah. And who authored a book on uh, race, gender, and class. And um, in order to be sure that we institutionally not just say those words, but that we act upon that we live that value of everybody gets everything, as you like to say, Karen, making sure everybody gets everything, um, regardless of you know the, the sexual 
orientation um, or identity or expression or, or, or down the line. And it's important to really educate. Language is changing quickly. Um, you identify as queer, Leslie. I can remember when I could not say that word. It was considered so offensive. Not to, I would not allow it. But that's how you choose to identify. And that has been, had to be a part of, of the journey as well, is to meet people where they are and to be open in that process of even now people are talking about pansexual, not only non-binary. Um, and so having that open, clear um, desire and intent to be in full authentic relationship with anyone uh, is really who we want to be at the Women's Foundation. I want to go back to the notion that I mentioned earlier that we seek and receive uh, feedback as a way that we learn, grow, and develop as an organization. Our first session in the, in the heart of the matter was uh, about race, and it was our race shapes our reality, or our race is our reality. And some of the feedback we got from that was, where was the conversation about health? That you didn't talk about health. Now, I know I have a response to that, but I wonder how you would respond to that. And bundle with that, how would you respond to the, uh, to the um, critique that a conversation about women was not a conversation about health? Who would like to start there? Well, I think that absolutely a conversation about women is a conversation about health. I mean, I'm sorry. I will never say, even though sometimes I think that we, you know, we are, my mother always says, the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the neck. There you go. So with that said, um, you know, I think that the health and, and not only physical health, but mental health and everything, you know, is based on nurturing and embracing and, and loving and caring. And I'm sorry, but women, as we identify as women and whoever we are, we have that sense of nurture and love and care. And we are there for our children, for our friends, for whoever needs us around to take care of our, uh, of our women is, you know, obviously or inherently to take care of their community or their, their families and so forth. So, you know, I think that by us protecting ourselves and helping each other, we're helping a, a full community. You know, just think about through this pandemic with COVID-19, all of the scareness that we have. I, um, I, I manage this, this hotel and I have three kids. My oldest kid is 10. And then, uh, you know, just as care of our day going back to work, the times that I am in the office, I am afraid. Sometimes I think I'm not spending that much time in there. And when my assistant GM or my coworkers, female said, how are you doing? Do you want to go and grab some coffee? Are you doing fine? Nurturing and taking care, it makes me feel at peace. And that's health. And, you know, sometimes we just get hung up in the technical part of it, but every little bit helps. So talking about race, talking about women, take, talking about our own individualities as a women, absolutely affect health and improve it. Lauren, I can see you want to talk. You can, I'm, I'm can so trained. You know that. that well. I'm I so trained. I can see you open in your mouth. And then, <laughs> that. You know, I think when we talk about health, there's the literal health. And in this pandemic, of course, we have seen um, black and brown communities decimated in terms of rates of death um, and women who are in caretaking positions as well as on the front lines inextricably intertwined with health. I think we also, even outside of the pandemic, the maternal death rate for women of color is um, inexcusable in particular for black women. And it's not based solely on either education or on income. It is race-based, as well as child morbidity rates, reproductive health, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all of those things that are showing up that are making us more vulnerable. 
But when we think about it, there's also the whole systemic. Finally, we're saying that racism, racism is in fact a public health issue. Um, poverty is a public health issue. Violence, whether it is um, including violence that is imposed by the state, it has become revealed as a public health issue. We cannot talk about women, and even when our Black men are lying on the street, who do we see on those microphones? Who do we see kneeling in the streets? Who do we see standing up in front um, of the marches and the rallies? Uh, it's women. It's the mamas to which you referred at the beginning and who are often called for as breath is taken away. So when we talk about whether it's structural um, health, whether it's those, those very specific disease systems that result from inadequate health and under-resourced, I'm seeing this um, in the chat, um, and under-invested communities, that's what marginalization means. And women, um, so often the burden of those movements falls on the backs of women of color. Um, and not only, but we pick them up, back to being fierce, right? We don't fall down, we pick them up, even if there is pain um, that we're experiencing in the midst of it all. So I think they're inextricably intertwined. Thank you. So now, and today I'm gonna bring you in on this next part of the conversation. As, um, Taryn mentioned as she was welcoming folks, today is uh, Women's Equality Day. And it's meant to recognize the ratification of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. Um, now, the women's suffrage movement was primarily, and what we learn in school and are taught in school, is primarily a white woman's movement. We don't have any, we don't have white women represented on this, in this panel. So um, I'm gonna bundle a lot of questions together, a lot of comments and thoughts together and then have you respond to it. So one is what's the role of white women in the movement to uplift women of color? And you can choose how you want, if you wanna answer any or all of these. How would you compare and contrast the plight of white women to women of color in this state. Uh, I was interviewed for an article that a, that a local, mag, that the 5280 magazine did locally on the 19th Amendment. And the questions to me were essentially, you know, how do I feel about the, the celebration of the 19th Amendment and why do I vote? And my, I started my answer with, you know, well, as a black person, like many things, as a black person, that's complicated. Because the women's, the white women's suffrage movement distanced themselves from working class white women and intentionally broke away from any, any um, connection to the black suffrage movement because the black suffragettes were a liability in getting Southern white women support for the vote. And I said, so even though we got the right to vote, not much changed for black women in 1920. Just as not much changed for black men 50 years earlier when they got the right to vote. There was still uh, voter intimidation, not even intimidation, it's voter terrorism. And so from, from my parents, my parents would probably say they didn't really feel like they really had the right to vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So now the question in that is, because we all, that it's complicated, we live that every day, our interaction with dominant systems. So the question, the additional question embedded in that is, do you, how often do you, and when do you feel the need to articulate that complication to people versus when you just keep it internal? So there's that, what's the role of white women? in um, the movement now and then what's the, and how do you see the plight of white women and women of color in Colorado? So it's kind of three big questions, pick whatever you want. So I'm gonna start with Tanea. Okay, yeah, that's, that's definitely a lot. 
I had seen a comment earlier, I think it was somebody from Cortez, Colorado, just talking about, um, I think she was saying her experience as a white woman and she can see how she's treated differently from other people. And I know Lauren had brought up about the reservations earlier. And for me, as I'm an indigenous and black woman, but you know, I'm very like light I, um, and colorism is a whole other thing. Sometimes I might be like, I'm white passing and then people be like, no, you're not. But um, so um, anyway, um, growing up, I grew up on the Southern Ute Reservation um, for most of my life. And there definitely was a difference, you know, in how I was treated from some of my white friends and how they were treated, even just at restaurants and not really knowing like, oh, okay, that's, that's racism. Cause when you're younger, you're not able to name those things. And then if you, for me, you know, like going to college, like I saw somebody else saying like being the only person of color in a lot of your, their classrooms, like that was my experience as well. Like I was studying English at Stanford and I was only like brown person. And, and I'll see like the differences even now, like living in Boulder County, going to the doctor's offices and, and how I'm treated. And sometimes I'll wear like my Stanford sweatshirt just so they will ask me like, oh, do you know someone who went there? It's like, no, I went there. So they'll perhaps treat me better, treat me differently. And, and now at my job at CU, like I work at a predominantly white institution. And I would say that's where I see a lot of these dynamics playing out is some people will come just as like what I consider good allies and just listen and ask how they can help. And they'll, they'll be the ones to help make pitches for things that they might be, it might go easier through their, their filter or um, I would say also like the women who have accesses to access to resources and just say here, um, this is funding, use it for what you want to use it and not like expecting more. And then there are those times where you kind of have to negotiate, like somebody will say, hey, we're writing this proposal and we want to like include your program because your program serves native kids. What can we do? And so sometimes I'll have to take a deep breath and decide like, am I going to lay stuff out or am I just going to like do this with grace. And sometimes when I try to have the graceful comments, it's still is like one instance I said, um, well, here's all the questions you're asking is on our website. Here's the, here's the link. Um, we can work with you, but only in these capacities, like trying to say my needs. But then sometimes they'll just turn around and not really listen to what I was saying and say, okay, but what about this? And then I have to take like a little firmer, firmer stance. But I would say that um, for me, I would say, I, I don't feel like a lot has changed in how we're being treated and how I see my mother or grandparent or grandmothers being being treated and and how we're being treated today. Like, I think there was a period where people just bit, held back their tongues and maybe tried to not say racist comments or not try to act out on those. And then, you know, with this administration now, I feel like people are getting more brave to say the things they didn't they were just holding inside and so i think having that like holding this space of like intersectionality i think it's it's difficult you know i didn't the first i didn't vote in the until i was maybe 24 because i didn't really feel like i had a voice i didn't really feel like it mattered you know i knew who our tribal representatives were i knew who people voted into council but when I was a freshman going to college and people were so upset when George Bush won and it, I, I was just like, I didn't really understand the implications. And then the older you get and the more you learn about all of, all of these systems, then that's when you realize like you have to stand up, you have to use your voice and you have to find people who are going to help elevate and uplift your voice because you're speaking for, for people who don't often get that platform to make these changes. Matt, nah, what? How would any of those that you would respond to? That was quite the question, and yes, I would like to respond to some of this because it's absolutely relevant to my own personal experiences. So, just to give uh, those who are participants some context as to why I think the way I do, I had to flee from my homeland from Vietnam due to the war. Um, by no choice of our own. We've, we've fled everything that was familiar to us, everything that we owned, uh, only to take a chance at something that was not guaranteed to us, which was another life, right? We stayed on two different refugee camps indefinitely, not knowing when we were going to have that remote possibility of starting over and being safe and being able to be reunited with our families because 
there was family separation back then. There was family separation since the onset of this country. And I believe the biggest misconception for those um, who do not know refugees, who don't know immigrants, is that they feel the minute that we land in the United States, all of our problems are solved. That couldn't be far from the case. There were protesters, there were anti-refugee people holding up signs protesting at the refugee camp that we stayed on, saying, we don't want the gooks here. We want you to go back to where you came from. And the intent behind that was to say, you're still not welcome. You're never going to be welcome because we don't want them here. And in fact, um, I saw in the comment box and just this morning, I'm going to add this to it too. It was a, just announced by ICE that there is a Vietnamese refugee who was just uh, assigned to the position of being the head of ICE. And his comments were basically, I'm here because I came here legally. I came here because my family went through the correct path. And it really resonated with me as something, someone who has so far removed themselves from who they truly are, from the fact that he's a refugee, from the fact that there are those currently who are fighting to be here at, with the same ass that he was granted to be allowed to start a new life, to provide for his family, and he is distancing himself from exactly who they are. And that's just exactly the kind of mentality to dehumanize people, to exclude them, to say that, you know, I, I'm, I was granted permission here, I'm doing fine, so forget the rest of you. And it's just atrocious to me, absolutely atrocious. And getting back to your question, Karen, of how that was impacted uh, with the 19th Amendment and the ratification, a lot of women were excluded, indigenous, Asian, Latina, uh, immigrant women, black women were completely excluded. And even though it addressed that whole issue of, of gender, it did not include the issue of the fact that Asian women weren't even allowed to vote because we weren't allowed to become citizens at the time. There were obstacle after obstacle. There were literary, literary tests, liter, uh, literacy tests for Latino women. There were nationality tests for indigenous women that blocked and prevented us from raising our voices. And guess what? All of these suffragettes that are women of color are never even mentioned. Mabel Lee, there is um, Fannie Lou Hamer, there are people who are just doing incredible things and they marched alongside with all of these women who are suffragettes who'd gotten exactly what they asked for in 1920. And it took decades and decades after that before we could even become naturalized citizens. In 1952, after the Immigration Natural Nationality Act of 1952. So that just tells you that we have to fight harder, we have to fight smarter, we have to fight in groups, we have to cohesively understand that my struggle is your struggle, your struggle is my struggle, and that's the only way we can move forward. Because Asian Americans in particular are the groups that are completely overlooked in conversations of race. Refugees and immigrants are never mentioned in, in actual meaningful conversations and legislation in order for us to be able to be recognized as human beings. And no matter how many accomplishments we have, no matter how long we've been in the United States, we're always told to go back to where we came from as the perpetual foreigner. We're always told that we don't belong here. And that needs to change. That needs to change. And I know all the women on, on this panel are doing their part and more to do that. But in recognizing we have very, very special biases that are very unique to us, that are never said to other people, because no matter how people look at me, I'm always the foreigner. I cannot hide my race. I cannot hide where I came from. But guess what? I'm a damn proud refugee. And I love the fact that they know I'm not from here because I belong here. Well, thank you. And there is just, I can't even read fast enough to see all the, the comments that are flying about an, an affirmation of of what you're saying now. Liz, I'll let you have a few words on this and I'm gonna move us to the conversation about the fight going forward. Yeah, no, I think what Nas said was like um, amazing. I wanna hold space for that because 
your power comes out in so many ways. I, I want to just say how much I love you. I appreciate your advocacy at the Capitol. Um, you really do walk your talk and you fight for immigrants. You fight for people. Oh God, I'm just so, you are so inspiring. So thank you for sharing that and for being so powerful in that. Um, what I want to talk about is um, a conversation that I often have with um, black women, my mother, um, and that's really about trusting white women and how we should not do it. Never put your faith in a white woman because they will turn their backs on you. And I know we're changing this, but I want to call it out because this is rooted in real issues that we've had as women of color for generations. You talk about the suffragettes um, who turn their backs on the black women who are fighting with them. You know, um, it is, you talk about feminism and how it intentionally left out women of color, you know? And so what I want to talk about now is how we're in a space um, of real reckoning where people are saying and owning their own racism, their own internal issues, what's really going on with them. And I so value that and appreciate that. And I saw it in the comments where there's so many white women who said, I'm still trying to figure this out, you know? But in Karen, in the question that you asked about, you know, was race really a health issue? What I heard in that was, I don't really want to talk about it. I didn't come here for that. I didn't come here to talk about race. I'm sick of talking about race, you know? And I think for white women who are in this space, we really have to start having the conversation about what white women can do better as white women. But you got to acknowledge there's a lot of skepticism within specifically, I can only speak for the black community because we feel so left behind. And as I start to unpack that, you know, I realize that a lot of it comes because for so long, white women have felt that their struggle is the same as a woman of color struggle or as a black woman's struggle. And it negates the race part. It negates the intersectionality part. And what we have to do is really understand that while all of our struggles are different, there are some similarities in them and we should lift each other all up, you know, lift each other all up together. Um, and I think that's a real hard conversation. And so as we talk about moving forward, Karen, I know you wanna talk about what we're gonna do next. I would love to have more conversations with women of color and white women to talk about that, right? To be very real about our struggles, even with each other and how together as women, we can lift each other all up. Cause quite frankly, it hasn't always happened, but um, I'm just grateful for this conversation. I'm grateful, Karen, that you are at the helm having these very tough conversations. And to all of my women out there, white women and women of color, um, interracial women, thank you so much for sharing your story. Stories. Thank you for being in the comments. Oh, and one thing I have to lift up before we forget, because I know we're moving on. Um, we do have to lift up also women with disabilities because so very rare are they seen in any of these conversations. Um, and we need to, we need to. So thanks again. Well, Leslie, part of what I heard you say and what I heard a lot of you, and you as well, Nah, is that in, in the fight uh, against sexism, White women have largely ignored or unrecognized their complicitness in racism. You know, Go ahead, Lauren. I have to I have to share a story. When I was a student at CU Denver, um, I was selected to attend. This was back in the seventies, um, but I was selected to attend a conference in Colorado Springs, where some of the most notable women in the feminist movement were putting on a conference. And one of those notables, whose name um, I won't mention, I asked, why are there no other women of color, right? specifically black women um, at that time? And she said to me, you had your turn with the civil rights movement. Now it is ours. And I struggle even at the Women's Foundation, my staff will say, when we say, um, women and people of color, that, that how we come to, we've seen intersectionality here within the chats uh, a number of times, but there has been, as, as Leslie said, whether it's the Me Too movement or the marches, how many people remember that Tarana Burt started the Me, hashtag Me Too movement? So I think back to your other question about what does it feel like to be angry or to be in our voice or whatever. Um, we have to be comfortable in those places of discomfort. And, 
and we have to build spaces that have discomfort within them, which doesn't mean places of attack, but I don't think it can be acceptable to just fall into helplessness or shame or guilt. One of the things, and I've put up here our Women's Foundation anti-racism resources, one thing that's coming out now is everybody's got lists. So we can say, you have to do that work. You have to do the, the learning work. You have to do the self work. You have to do the work. That it is not actually the role of any of us on this panel to simply make other people feel more comfortable. But if you want to meet me in a space that might be a little bit uncomfortable, but is a place of truth and love at the same time, I'm all in. I am all in for that. So I don't know if any of you remember, uh, you know, there's a website called History is a Weapon or the book, uh, This Bridge Called My Back, that was an anthology of Black feminists and feminists, not just Black feminists, but really feminists of color, really diverse, back in the 1980s. If you've never read The Bridge Poem by Donna Kate Russian, um, I urge you to do that. But talking about the exhaustion of the translation role that we all play between communities and how ultimately our responsibility is to be the bridge to our own selves. Um, and that sense of self-care is an act of revolution in and of itself. Um, as a public health issue, I think is also important because of the trauma that women of color experience in so many aspects of our lives. Um, there's no one area I can say within my life where um, trauma hasn't raised its head at some point. You know, here, I, I just want to give a little quick per perspective that is a little different. And, and it's my experience. I am not saying that I represent many, but, but listen to this. I came here 14 years ago. I have a master's degree. I speak five languages. And every single job that I was offered was as a housekeeper when I came here. That's all I could get because people would not see me behind what I look. I said, you know, I have to start somewhere. And I started working at this wonderful hotel. Well, my boss was, is a, a, a white male Jewish guy. And everybody here in Vail, Vail, Colorado is, you know, full of wealth and it's, it's a different thing. And, and there are definitely not many Latino educated women. And almost everybody is white. I, I, I generally joke saying, hi, I am the diversity, you know, every time that I go anywhere, because it's basically me, the Latino. Yet those white people were the ones who gave me the chance to be where I am. You know, it was my boss who said, you know, do you want to move forward and continue with, you know, advancement in your work? It was my co-workers who said, you know, you can totally do it. It is why fellows around that say, do you want to participate on this board or that board or that board? Not that I like to be on boards. Um, I am learning still quite a bit, but it's my duty and obligation as a Latino to be in there to represent my community. So even though, yes, there's a lot of changes still to happen, a lot of things have moved forward in the right direction already. I have been discriminated. Absolutely. I don't know how many times I've been stopped by police officers, being harassed. I've been, you know, you name it. I have not been given shaking the hands because I'm the help. But so what? It hurts. It does. But I personally have decided not to dwell on that sad fact, but move forward and going even stronger and harder and you know, elevate the community. And that's when I hear the conversations, I really feel blessed with Eagle County, you know, Bell Valley Foundation, the Bell Hospital, um, Bright Future Foundation, the Mira Voss, I mean, you name it. Everybody is here for everybody. Granted, I have to help my community because what happened with the Latino is with the lack of education, we're shy to ask. We don't know where to go, how to do. So. I feel my mission is kind of, as I mentioned before, to elevate everybody. And I am most grateful for the white people in my life that have helped me to become 
who I am and that have accepted me. And that includes my entire staff. So I am the only Latino general manager here in Vail. And thank you to my staff who is all white, who allows me to be their, their boss. So yes, there is a lot of pain and yes, there is a lot of things that still have to change, but let's don't lose sight of all the things how we have moved forward. And I think that's based in my case on education. I recognize how lucky I was, but it was not, you know, I had to gain it and I have to move forward and it was, I had to base it on someone. And for me, that was my education, so. Thank you. And, and I think, Magda, you bridge two things for us. One, you make a good point. I don't imagine any of us on this, uh, given where we are in our society, I don't think any of us, um, I'll put it differently. I think most of us probably had white sponsors, white advocates, white supporters, promoters that helped us and helped and saw the potential we had, saw the achievement rec and recognized it. So um, that was, a, that was a, a great reflection. And then you also bridge us into what should we be doing now? You know, you're focused on education of your community. That's what needs to happen now in order to be, um, to make things better for women. So as the, I, kind of our last question is what, what kind of, what, what systems need to change now? What needs to happen right now to make things better for women? Um, Tanae, I'll let you start. I think it's a lot of what's been, what's been said. I think I think for me, I think it's, it's that teaching, it's that mentoring, it's help lifting each other up and realizing like it's not always going to be short game, but sometimes that's long, long term. It's a long game. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon and it's like a, I, I love chess. It's also like a strategic chess game. And one quick anecdote I'll share is just when I was in graduate school and I wanted to be a writer, I was just entering like the publishing game. I didn't know a lot of, about it. But I went to a school that I chose because I wanted a mentor. And the mentor that I wanted to work with at the time was Joy Harjo. And she helped me. She brought me into the conversation. Like she had no ego about it. She was, she was like, I want your name on the cover, the same size font as mine. Because when I was your age and I did this, I did all the work co-editing the book and they wanted my name in smaller font. They didn't want my photo on the back. And so she was paying it forward and teaching me like how to how to be empowered and how to share that space so she was gave me my first book publication working with her name size same pictures on the back and now she's the second term U.S. Poet Laureate of the United States and now I'm a success I would say I'm a successful writer like I'm working on my next book my second book and so I made a promise then and there. It's like, I'm going to do this too. Like when I'm going to always like make sure that I share my space, that I bring other people to the table, that I pass the mic when I need to, to other women, other people who, do, who could voice. And I, I'm not just hogging all the space and to provide opportunities. So like Magda, I kind of worked my way up. Like I started as a college student, already working for my job. And now 11 years later, I'm the director of my program and when my assistant director was leaving, I had a chance to change the salary for that assistant director. And so I, and I knew that the person coming to work for me was going to be a woman of color. She's an indigenous woman. And I said, I want her to make what she is worth. And so she was making her first year what it took me 10 years to get to at CU. And I was able to like advocate for those. And so I always try to, every single thing I do, whether it's one talking agreement and I can slide in another person's name if it's one panel if it's one performance like I always want to try to bring other people to the table and share that platform and space because you never know like those seeds you are planting and how many years from now that continual uplifting will continue to occur. Thank you. Thank you so much to and Lauren. You know I think there's so many things that need to happen next and I know um, public policy, I think I'm going to let Leslie really run with that, but I think we have to look at public policy um, issues in terms of really moving ourselves forward. But in that human dynamic, Magda, I, you know, it's funny as you were speaking, at one of the times when I was most tired in the recent weeks, the murder of George Floyd, um, the pandemic, um, I felt profound gratitude for where I am in my life and the fact that I also 
have a home, <laughs> that I have food, um, all of those things that are struggles right now, those basic needs are struggles. And a friend of mine, um, older white woman of extreme privilege, um, provided me with groceries because she just knew that I wasn't getting out, had her daughter bring them over and didn't ask anything of me, but she was representative of someone who's been throughout my life. I flunked out of college, came to Colorado afterwards after having experienced a violent sexual um, assault rape attempt and a series of profound losses. And there were a group of diverse women all of whom came together at CU Denver, having experienced life, having hit us hard in some way, who were able um, to work together and who continued to support each other. But what has to happen next, I think, is the education. Um, it's an education about our own history and the history of this country. Um, it's education of certainly self-advancement it's continuing to have the conversations and the forums that we are having here today. The Women's Foundation is committed to investing in women and girls of color statewide. And our board voted unanimously for that investment, um, building boards and staffs that are rich and diverse and comfortable with the discomfort um, and when I say rich and diverse, I mean in the fullest sense of the richness of who we are and what we bring. Um, and giving voice and supporting each other. And these young voices, uh, Tanea, you have to meet one of the girls, Clarissa, who's featured in our video for annual luncheon, where I quote Joy Arjo, by the way, is on her way to Stanford, she hopes. So I will connect you later. But I think it's a part of it is in fact, this human connection um, that has to occur. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Matt. This is such an important question, especially now. Um, in, in speaking about things that we can do, um, I feel as though it, it shouldn't have to take a pandemic. It shouldn't have to take an exclusion act. It shouldn't have to take an internment camp to recognize that there are people who are specifically targeted because of things that are beyond our control, which is where we were born, what our ethnicity is, uh, where we came from. And we're seeing that amplified a hundredfold right now in the United States since the pandemic started because there are derogatory terms, there are uh, intentional carelessness and recklessness in the usage of words in order to incite uh, those who already have negative, uh, just negative images and already fired up about people who are others who don't belong here. Um, most recently, there was a protest going on in New York because an 89-year-old elderly Asian woman, a woman was set on fire. Uh, there was a lighter that was, uh, there were two unknown males that went behind her and trying to set her on fire, and luckily she was able to put out the fire. There were attacks in San Francisco of an elderly Asian man who was beaten by a, a cane that he was using to pick up recycled cans um, to uh, supplement his income. So it just appears to me that why does it take something so extreme? Why does it take a protest? Why does it take those who are being uh, victims of violence and xenophobia in order for us to have these conversations? And when we do include um, BIPOC and women of color, it needs to be in a very meaningful, meaningful role. It's not as a token. It's not for a photo op. It's not to do your supplemental work because you're understaffed. It's to recognize and value the, in, the resources and the benefit that you have from gaining that perspective from, from someone who under any other, I mean, who would know that topic more so than anyone else. There is no one who's going to know the refugee experience better than a refugee. There's no one who's going to know the Asian experience better than a person who's of Asian descent. And therefore, there needs to be that intentional inclusiveness to show that they're being valued, not only as, 
as, as someone who is having a seat at the table, but the seat at the table needs to be something that is very intent, very much intended to respect and value that person's experiences and what they bring to the table. And the changes need to be implemented in a way that's going to not just benefit those who are always raising their voices that you hear in the mainstream conversations, but those who are constantly, constantly left out. And which is why I do the work that I do in trying to raise these issues. Um, I'm, a, I'm the Colorado Delegate for Refugee Congress, which is a nonprofit organization. This is what I do in my free time, by the way. I actually have a full-time job, but this is what I do in my free time is to advocate. But we have a delegate for each state, and, and it just tells me the unified voice and concerns that we have, despite the fact there are refugees from Sierra Leone, from Liberia, from Iran, Iraq, all over the world, represented all over the world. And yet we're, we're talking about conversations that have identical themes, identical concerns, because our seat at the table has not brought that change. Our seat at the table was for that photo op, was for the tokenism, and it wasn't for something that really is going to impact the change that we need, that we can provide input for. So that's really significant. Thank you. Thank you, Nye. And Leslie, we're about to overstay our welcome with folks. So I'm going to let you have the, the last word on this, this question of what needs to happen now before I close this out. Sure. Well, thank you again for having me. And thank you to the amazing women on this panel. Um, you know, I think we do have some policy to set right. Um, Senator Kamala Harris said, and infamously when she was um, questioning a witness was, can you think of any policies that specifically regulate a man's body, right? Any laws that specifically regulate a man versus a woman? And they, this man, I won't say who, who was responding, act baffled. Well, I need a more direct question. Well, you, you, you got it as directly as it needed to be, right? <laughs> but there, all right, there are so many policies that are very blatantly discriminate, discriminatory towards women and um, our ability to make choices for ourselves. But also there are some that are less blatant um, around mothers and around child care, um, around where a woman should be in the workplace versus, you know, or at home as versus in the workplace or in education and whatnot. And so we really have to change all of that. And it's very systemic, right? It's very systemic. So. While we can talk about the issues like equal pay, we got to go also deeper, right? And look at all the structures that are put in place that actually keep women um, from achieving that equal pay and that equal uh, view in society. But we also have to, to respect and appreciate motherhood and womanhood and whatever that looks like, not just to achieve what a man has, right? Or not just to achieve this um, colonialistic, capitalistic view of what success is, but actually embrace all women in everything that they want to be, um, which I'm excited to work on that effort with so many women at the Colorado General Assembly. We are actually led by women, which is quite phenomenal. I also get, have to give a shout out to the Fly Ladies, which is a group of women um, leaders who have embraced me, a diverse group of women who lift each other up every day. And what I appreciate about these women is that if there's a woman who tears down other women or who's known to tear down other women, they're not allowed to be a part of the group which I think is so impactful, right? Because we can't just talk about it and then not walk the walk in every aspect of our, of our work. And so I love these ladies and for what they're putting out there and how they're combating this notion that women can't support other women or that there can only be one of us in a room or one of us on a panel, um, that we all can be on there together. And then finally, I have to give one more uh, shout out, which is um, to Lorez Meinhold, the executive director of the Caring for Denver Foundation. Karen, we do a lot of work together, but as women, we need to focus on our mental health. As women of color, we are going through a lot of trauma right now, especially with these times around COVID, um, the call for racial equity, and the weight that's just been on our shoulders for generations. We've got to take care of our mental health. We've got to lift that up. Um, we've got to ask for help when we need it and support each other in getting the support that we need. And so Caring for Denver is focused on substance use and mental health support for all those living in Denver um, but we have programs, everyone, you know, there's mental health programs around the state. We have to have more access to it. And as women, as women, we have to demand this as a central part of our health care and taking care of our own bodies and our own selves. And so, again, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to future conversations. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, 
for just this incredible conversation. I know we could go on another hour or so, but our time has, is coming to an end. So thank you all. And I look forward to all that you're going to keep doing in your fearlessness and fabulosityness. Uh, let me just say to folks as we, as we close out, in, our, in the conversation we had on race, and, and as you talk with people about race, oftentimes people can't see the connection that race plays in their lives and how it race impacts them in any way. Yet I would deny anyone to say they don't understand the connection between women and their lives and how they, you have to be in support of women. And as Lauren said, it's, it's an act of um, revolution to take care of yourself. It's an act of civil disobedience to take care of yourself because so many people, institutions, municipalities, governments are counting on, depending on, betting on, and profiting from the fact when we don't. So even if and when others don't lift up in our, um, on our behalf, we have to continue to lift up on behalf of ourselves and our, and our sisters. And I just want to end, I mean, we started with a poem. I want to end with a poem. And last week I ended with the words from a song that I did not dare sing. And this time I'm going to end with someone else's words. And I also, in this case, do not dare to try to imitate um, or replicate the, the resonance and the voice of a Maya Angelou. I want to close out with reading her poem, Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you so beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got all wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? <laughs> Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard, because I laugh like I got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meaning of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. And with that, I thank you all again for attending. I invite you to join us on September 30th when we have a conversation with some young folks who are the next generation of good troublemakers. Enjoy the rest of your day. Good night. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, ladies.